Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together in your name. We praise you for the Lord's Day. We praise you for your calling us together because you have something to give us, word and sacrament. As we turn now, Lord, to chapters 34 to 66 in the great book of Isaiah, we ask for your blessing, your guidance. May your word be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the second half of the study of the uh, book of uh, Isaiah. We're going to study uh, chapters 34 to, um, to 66. <clears throat> Just to review where we were um, a little while uh, ago, uh, you'll recall that Isaiah is what is considered one of the major prophets. It's not that Isaiah is more important uh, than the other prophets. When a major prophet is designated in Scripture, it simply means the, the length of the book. So you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They're all considered uh, major uh, prophets uh, in, in Scripture. And you'll recall that Isaiah began his ministry 740 years uh, before the birth of our Lord and that he's known as the prophet of the Redeemer. There is no other prophet that is quoted as much in um, the New Testament as the book of, uh, of Isaiah. And uh, when we studied chapters 1 to 33, we took a look at, at five themes. You could really summarize it uh, to. Um, God is the true king. God is present in the midst of his people. God's presence is a two-edged sword. Because God is merciful and gracious, he's also a just God. So that if one spurns then the Messiah, one is only left with the justice of, uh, of God. The fourth was God restores his remnant people and God's people are a witness to all nations. So those five themes kind of summarized uh, what we studied in chapters 1 to 33. God's the true king. He's present in the midst of his people. God's presence, a two-edged sword. God restores his repentant people and God's people are a witness to all nations. As we turn now to chapters 34 to uh, 66 uh, in the book, we see that chapters 34 and 35, they, they really play a, uh, a dual role here in concluding the first half of the book. And we'll see what that dual role is in a, in a few moments. And they uh, strike then the introductory chords for chapters 40 to 66. So you'll say, well, what about the four chapters then uh, before that? That really is a, an historical appendix uh, that, that we'll see. So what we see here today is we see the striking of the chord that sets up for chapters 40 to 66, which um, has been termed uh, the, book of, uh, the book of comfort. And you'll hear that, that theme constantly throughout uh, these, um, these chapters. So uh, there's, there's four different themes that I want to touch on today. So I'm just going to give a word or two that will just provide a little summary uh, for us. We're going to talk about highway. We're going to talk about refuge and strength, possibility, and temptation. And those are just some... Um, just little organizing points around what we're going to talk today. Highway, refuge, and strength, possibility, and temptation. So let's start in Isaiah, the 34th chapter, please. A good way to find the book of Isaiah is open up to the book of Psalms and then start turning right. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Sol Song of Solomon. Then you'll get to uh, Isaiah. Uh, if you've gone to Jeremiah, you're too far. Um, if you're in Romans, um, ask your neighbor uh, because you've, you're, you're, you're not there. You're not there. But we've all gotten lost. It's okay. Grace abounds. So, uh, chapter 34, and we'll pick up in uh, verse 1. Draw near, O nations, to hear. O peoples, give heed. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged 
against all the nations and furious against all their hordes. He has doomed them and has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out and the stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountain shall flow with their blood. Why does it speak of God being so enraged with humankind? Well, Romans, the third chapter, helps us. So keep your finger here. Let's go to book of Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. There's no one who's righteous, not even one. There's no one who has understanding. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There's no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. We see in Isaiah God's rage against creation. And his rage is because of the reality of sinfulness. Such a beautiful confession, is it not in its entirety that we confess? We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done, by what we've left undone. And it's all encompassing, isn't it? And it reflects the condition of our sin. That all of our sin is simply reflective of the condition of sin that we have from the moment of conception onward. We are a sinner. And sin angers God. Chapter 34 functions one way. Chapter 35 functions in a contrasting uh, way. And chapters 34 and 35 can really be compared to the two great doctrines of law and gospel. That's the interpretive key to scripture. It's an interpretive key to say, is this law, does this show our sin? Or is this gospel, does it show us our Savior? Um, Remember uh, what Luther uh, maintained is that don't ever mix the two. And he said, when you mix the two, when you mix law and gospel, you get a muddy mess, he said. And so a strength of Lutheran theology and a strength of Lutheran teaching, if it's orthodox, it's, it is the f- clear focus on the law is the law and the gospel is the gospel. Let me give you an example of how the, the two of them can get mixed and it becomes mud. The Lord Jesus Christ has died and risen for you. You are forgiven in his name. Now all you have to do is believe. You hear it? You hear what happens there? When the gospel proclamation is mixed with the law? Let let me give give you uh, another example. If you want to have dessert, you have to eat your peas. Okay? Hear it mix, right? There's the gospel, uh, loosely defined. There's, There's the gospel, ice cream, dessert. And if you want your dessert, this is what you have to do to get your dessert. Hear that? And so a, a, a key to Lutheran proclamation, a key to the scriptures, is making sure that one distinguishes between law and gospel. Chapter 34 and 35 really function in two contrasting ways as law and gospel. Take a look, please, at chapter 35, verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool 
and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. Now, if those, if those words sound a little familiar to you, it's Matthew 11 and Jesus' uh, use of that when he's asking, answering a question of John the Baptist. So let's keep our finger here. Let's go to Matthew, the 11th chapter. Matthew 11, verse 2. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who's to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. So he uses this part of Isaiah and he answers John's question with really a reference to Scripture. That's the best way to, ask, to answer people's questions, isn't it? It's the best way. Is just turn them right into the Word. Because then, then you're not the issue. They have to wrestle with the, with the Word. To turn them right to the word is precisely what Jesus does with regard to John. Okay, back to Isaiah 35, verse 8. And here comes our, our first word here to kind of organize our, our time together. Highway. Verse 8. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. Five times in the book of Isaiah, this reference to highway uh, appears. And each time it depicts a place where people can walk uh, from safety from one place to uh, another the ultimate image here, of course, is the Christian church. As we walk on our way to the glory of heaven uh, itself, on the highway of God's grace. Where when the day comes and he takes us home, we'll truly be home. We'll truly be home. Not based upon our merits, but based upon his grace. And he has provided the highway, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as one looks at the world and one sees all of the sin in the world in all of its manifestations, we can still be a people of joy as we walk on this highway of God's grace, knowing who we are and knowing what our purpose is. Because we are heaven-bound. And for the Christian today, is one more day in all of eternity, right? It's just a matter of where. It's just a matter of where. We can then approach death with absolutely no fear. We've used the phrase before, death is transition and living here. It's transition and living. It, it's a matter of location, a matter of location. And we walk on that highway of his grace. Okay, chapter 34, law. Chapter 35, we hear gospel then you go into 36 to 39 this is an historical interlude here before we get to the uh, to the book of of uh, comfort which is 40 to 66 and it bridges the gap between two periods the assyrian period and the babylonian period in isaiah's day the chief enemy was assyria but we see um, in Isaiah's message that most of his message has to do with the coming enemy with regard to Babylon and what will uh, occur. And chapter 39 shows us how Babylon first came into contact with 
Judah. And how it foreshadowed, we're going to get into this later, how it foreshadowed uh, the, um, the exile. So, let's look at the interlude here now. And let's, um, let's start with verse 36, or chapter 36, verse 1. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. The 14th year of Hezekiah is, is 701 BC. You, you can date that with, with, uh, with specificity. And just a little aside, um, the Great Wall of China is being being built at this time just just to just to frame where that is historically and how old the the wall is uh, right Uh, Assyria here under the under the king had swallowed up the northern kingdom of Israel Judah is much smaller and so as it looks upon uh, Judah then the southern kingdom Judah looks like easy prey here easy prey all of his life Hezekiah had lived um, this this righteous life to God now we understand of course Hezekiah was a sinner right we understand that Um, but there there was an understanding and a heartbeat with regard to Hezekiah's life of of wanting to uh, glorify God of uh, trusting in uh, the God of Israel the one true God Let's look at chapter 36, verse uh, 13. Chapter 36, verse 13. Then the Rob Sheka, and and that's just a field commander. Then the field commander stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. The king sends then a blasphemous letter to Hezekiah. So there's this, there's this appeal here for the people not to listen to Hezekiah. The king of Assyria then sends this blasphemous letter um, in attempt to cowering them into submission. And Hezekiah prays. Verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and all their lands and have hurled their gods into the fire, though they were no gods but the work of human hands, wooden stone. And so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Look now at verse 21. Then Isaiah, son of Amaz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me concerning King Sennacherib of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. Let's jump down to 28. 
I know you're rising up and you're sitting down. You're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your arrogance has come to my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I will turn you back on the way by which you came. I think of the great psalm, Psalm 121. That God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Right? And here we see, amidst the threat of Assyria, we see the refuge and strength of God Almighty. As his people, we can walk along the highway of God's grace and God all along as we continue to walk this side of heaven is our refuge and strength. The Lord controls the affairs of people and the Lord controls the affairs of nations. Now, most likely, many in Jerusalem doubt it, right? (laughs) Because you've got uh, Syria and you've got little Judah. So most of them, or some of them at least, would certainly have wondered about this prophecy because the Assyrian army was just outside the city walls. Look at verse 33 of chapter 37. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, shoot an arrow there, Come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. He shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Highway. Refuge and strength. And now we have possibility that if God decrees something, God will indeed live it out. Let's now go and see how possibility here takes an interesting turn. Chapter 38, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and that was, was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember now, O Lord, I implore you how I have walked before you in faithfulness with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Chapter 38 is at or very shortly after the Assyrian invasion of 701. And Hezekiah is about 37 or 38. At, uh, at this point. <clears throat> and the Lord tells him, you're going to get sick and you're not going to recover uh, from this. Jump down now into verse 17. Surely it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness, but you have held back my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your, thank, for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they shall, uh, the living, the living, they thank you, as I do this day. Fathers made known to children your faithfulness. The Lord will save me, and he will sing to stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. This is a beautiful confession of Hezekiah because what does God do? 
God says, I'm not going to take you now. I'm adding years to your life. I'm adding years. You see, we have the possibility of God. If God promises something, bank on his promise. And if God says, Hezekiah, I'm not taking you. I'm adding to your years. That possibility then with God is rooted in his promise. And it's exactly what happens to Hezekiah. As we walk on the highway of his grace, we know that he is our refuge and strength. And we know that he holds our days and everything is within the decree of God. Everything depends upon him. And what God's will is, that will will be done. Look at verse 17 again. It's a beautiful image here of forgiveness. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. I love the the scripture that says that he has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. We've been made white as the driven snow. There's a beautiful image here, isn't it, of forgiveness where that sin has been put behind the back of God Almighty. With God, all things are possible. Then we go into 39. And Isaiah suscum, or Hezekiah succumbs to the sin. Of elevating his possessions. So here you have these beautiful images of highway and refuge and strength. That all things are possible to God. And then in 39 we see Hezekiah succumb to the sin of pride. Look at verse 1. At that time, King Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hear the entrance here now of Babylon. So these envoys come. It comes with, with letters here. It comes here um, with this present to Hezekiah. Possibly this is a, a political uh, maneuver on that, but there is, is spiritual significance with regard to this because Second Chronicles, the 32nd chapter, says that God had allowed this to happen and he allowed it because it was a test. It was a test here of Hezekiah. Verse 2, Hezekiah welcomed him. He showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show him. Hezekiah had pride in his possessions. Here the Lord had granted him extended life. Here the Lord was watching over uh, the people. Highway refuge and strength. All things are possible. And then we see the sin of Hezekiah where he has pride in his possessions. Keep your finger here, please, and go over to Matthew 6. Chapter, uh, chapter, yeah, Matthew 6, verse 19. Matthew 6, verse 19. And Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's the problem with Hezekiah? He was delighted in his treasure there is his source of pride Jesus puts it all into perspective and says where your treasure is what you do with your treasure it's a reflection of your heart 
Back now to chapter 39, verse 5. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts, days are coming, when all that is in your house and that which your ancestors have stored up until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who are born to you shall be taken away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. See, Hezekiah was more concerned about himself than the future generations. Peter has some important words for us. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5 in the New Testament. Good way to find 1 Peter is go to Revelation, the last book. Start turning left. You're going to quickly cross over the Johns. Then you're going to run into 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. So we pray, lead us not into temptation. And Luther's explanation, of course, of that petition of the Lord's Prayer is God tempts no one to sin, But we ask in this prayer that the the devil, the world, and our sinful self will not lead us astray. And so we see in Hezekiah here that he's led astray. We see God's faithfulness here, but we also see the sinfulness of Hezekiah. And then the glimpse ahead into Babylon and what will occur. So if you're going to look at preaching a sermon on these chapters, and that was be a wide swath here of chapters to preach a sermon on. But here you've got the theme of the highway of God's grace, God being our refuge and strength. All things are possible with God. And then indeed, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Well, we move next week then into chapters 40 to 44. And we enter into the book of comfort. This is the, uh, such a glorious portion of the book of Isaiah. And you're going to hear week after week here, the theme here that's going to keep popping up, comfort, comfort. We're going to see the faithfulness of God to his word. We're going to see prophecies of events that will occur some 150 years later. We're going to see a ruler named that obviously wasn't born at this time. We're going to see prophecy of how God is going to use a nation that historians confirm wasn't even in existence when Isaiah prophesied this. And so we will see the reliability of God's word And we will give thanks for comfort. We'll continue next week.